Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Michelle Dassinger, the Executive Director of Chicago Hyde Park Village. Um, thanks to all of you for joining this program today. We have over 230 people registered, um, which is just wonderful to see. I invite all of you to visit our website, chpv.org, to learn more about Chicago Hyde Park Village and see our other upcoming event, events uh, or to make a donation to support our work. I also wanna let you know that autographed copies of Sarah Paretsky's books are available at the Seminary Co-op Bookstore here in Hyde Park. If you uh, buy a book before seven o'clock tonight, the, um, it can be personalized just for you or as a gift. Uh, the bookstore is closed to in-person shopping, but you can shop on their website. Um, and they do have curbside pickup. I will, and I will put their uh, website in the, uh, the chat box for you. Uh, during the program, all participants will remain muted. If you do have a question you'd like to ask, please put it in the chat box and we will do our best to get to all questions. Um, and now I want to invite Susan Alito to introduce our special guest. And I hope you enjoy the program. Well, good afternoon. I could go, am I? I could go on at great length about our guests today, but in the interest of the program, I will try to be brief. Sarah Paretsky is our neighbor and a world famous author. Her books have been published in 30 countries. Ms. Paretsky helped to transform the mystery world in 1982 when she introduced Private Eye V.I. Warshawski, a tough, credible, sweet, smart, and feminine detective. Together with VI, Sarah proceeded to challenge the stereotypes of women in fiction as victims or as vamps and made it possible for a new generation to, of crime writers and fighters to thrive. In 1986, she organized Sisters in Crime, a group that advocates for women in the mystery world. She first came to Chicago from Kansas in 1966 to work as a volunteer in the civil rights movement. She returned in 1968 and has been a Hyde Park resident ever since. In addition to her famous V.I. Wachowski series, Sarah Paretsky has written forewords and afterwards to other important works, several short story collections and nonfiction volumes. She has received numerous awards, including the Cartier Diamond Dagger and Mystery Writers of America's Grand Master, as well as Ms. Magazine's Woman of the Year. She is joined today by her longtime friend, Margaret Kinsman, now retired from full-time teaching in English studies and currently a visiting research fellow in the popular culture at London South Bank University in the UK. She divides her time between Iowa City and London, and of interest to some of our members here, she is an Antioch College alum. She served for seven years as the executive editor of Clues, an American scholarly journal dedicated to mystery fiction. Kinsman received the 2016 Mystery Writers of America Raven Award for outstanding achievement in the mystery field. Her book, on Sarah Paretsky won the 2017 McCavity Award for Best Nonfiction. And now I turn the program over to Sarah and Margaret. First, Margaret. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Susan. A, a very warm welcome to this international audience of readers. I'm absolutely thrilled to be in conversation with Sarah today as guests of Chicago Hyde Park Village. I know Hyde Park and the larger Chicago area is justifiably proud of Sarah. She's a longtime neighborhood resident with her late husband, Courtney, and a number of golden retrievers. But on behalf of Iowa, which is where I'm zooming to you from today, we're also full of pride for Sarah. She was born in Ames, just down the road. A few years later, the family relocated to Lawrence, Kansas. So she didn't grow up here, but nearly. 
Um, in 2015, Iowa City UNESCO International City of Literature presented Sarah with the annual Paul Engel Prize, an award which honors a pioneering spirit in the world of literature and who like Engel himself makes an impact on his or her community and the wider world beyond. So here we are in conversation with this pioneering, impactful and local author, Sarah Paretsky, whose 20th novel Deadland was published by William Morrow earlier this year to critical acclaim, needless to say. Deadland is about land use among other things. VI finds herself involved in a fight over a secret plan to privatize a section of the beloved Chicago lakefront with a multi-million dollar luxury development. She also becomes involved with some local residents in rural Kansas who are struggling with aggressive corporate buyouts of farms and prairie land. VI is in Kansas in search of a missing singer songwriter, Lydia. Lydia and her fellow musician, Hector, also her lover, by the way, were performing at an outdoor concert at a Kansas beauty spot when a mass shooting takes place. Hector was one of the victims. This is the second novel to take VI out of the city and into the heartlands of Kansas. The land grab stories and Hector and Lydia's stories all come together in the end, though there are some white knuckle events en route. You'd expect nothing less. Sarah's going to read an extract. She and I will chat together for a while and then we'll open up to questions from the audience via the chat function. Sarah, please lead us into Deadland. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Susan, for your hospitality and to all of my neighbors and to friends far and wide, especially names that I recognize from across the Atlantic in the participants. Thank you all for spending part of this day, which is Beethoven's birthday, Jane Austen's birthday, and perhaps most important, the birthday of Madame Clico, who gave us clarified champagne to drink to celebrate all these other birthdays. <laughs> <coughs> I'm going to read from the beginning of the book. This book, a lot of the action takes place right here in Hyde Park. And it's a lot harder to write about a scene that's close up to you than one that's far away. So I wrestled with this. But we are in a, fi a fictional building on 47th Street, which used to be a, um, an important bank and landmark on the south side. The girls lined up along the wall, their faces glistening with sweat, still breathing hard. We could have won if Lorene had moved her fat ass into place to One girl, girl began, but Bernie silenced her. No one who plays for me calls another player a bad name, and there is only one way to lose a competition. And what way is that? The girl who'd issued the insult turned her head away, but the other seven chanted, dishonesty. Right, Bernie said. If you don't do your best, you are dishonest to yourself and to your team. If you do your best, you've won, even if the other team outscores you. You learn from mistakes, n'est-ce pas? Losing a match is only a loss if you don't learn and grow from it. Yes, coach. Louder you believe this. Yes, coach, they shouted. The South Side sisters had lost their match to the Lincoln Park Lions. Bernie had coached them with the ardor she brought to everything in her life and the girls adored her. They'd started sprinkling their conversation with French phrases. They copied her mannerisms, the way she stood with hands on hips, the way she smacked her palm against her forehead and groaned, oh mon dieu. Bernie's sport was hockey like her father, Pierre, like her godfather, my cousin, Boom Boom, both former Chicago Blackhawks stars. Unlike them, even though she was a gifted player, there wasn't any way for her to make a living at the game. So she was doing next best, majoring in sports management at Northwestern University. This summer, she'd been interning at a park district program on the South Side, coaching soccer. I'd come down to 47th Street to watch the 11-year-old sisters play their final match of a round rod robin tournament. The South Lakefront Improvement Council, SLIC, had helped sponsor the sisters and wanted them to take a bow following the game. SLIC was holding their monthly meeting and the girls were supposed to wait in the hall until someone came for them. A woman whose tightly curled hair was dyed a rusty brown opened the common room door and stuck her head into the hall. 
Can you girls keep it? Oh, are these our soccer players? Yes, Bernie said. We are a wonderful team, but we are not wonderful at waiting in the hall. When do we go in? Very soon, the woman tittered as if Bernie had made a joke. As she shut the door, we heard a man yelling from inside the room. You damned liar, where'd you come up with this pile of crap? You go to lying school? Because you sure as hell didn't learn this in any environmental studies program. The girls put their hands over their mouths to muffle their shocked laughter. I stuck my head through the door. The meeting room had served as a community hall back when Prairie Savings and Loan was a Bronzeville landmark. It held a shallow stage and perhaps 150 folding chairs arranged today in concentric semicircles. The seats were full, not because the community wanted to attend a, a meeting on, late summer, on a late summer afternoon, but because family members had been rooting for the sisters and wanted to see them get their awards. There was a fracas going on on the platform, a young man trying to make a presentation with a map of Lake Michigan and the, the land and beaches at 35th Street displayed on the wall behind him. But, but sir, this is part of the original Burnham plan, or at least it's how Burnham, like crap, it's the Burnham plan. Although the younger man had a mic, the protesters shout drowned it out. He charged up the aisle to the stage. The youth flinched, dropped his mouse. When he bent to pick it up, his computer hit the floor and the picture on the wall behind the stage disappeared. Before the protester reached the steps, several audience members were there blocking his path. He wrestled with them, still shouting, when a pair of Chicago cops appeared from a far corner. They pinned the man's arms behind his back and marched him down the aisle and out the door, shoving me to one side. The woman on the stage was marching back and forth across the short platform. She slapped a wooden pointer against the open palm of her left hand as if it were a field marshal's swagger stick. Our council is committed to protecting the lake and the lake front. We scrutinize every action that impacts Lake Michigan. I've been living on the South Side since I was 19. I raised three children here. I've dedicated my life to this community and to our lakefront. I resent professional protesters coming in here trying to overturn the apple cart. Here, here, cried a man with a gavel. No professional protesters. Next to me, Bernie was frowning, worried by the way the meeting was devolving. This would be a good time for your girls to get their awards, I said. Otherwise, the meeting's going to turn into a gong show and your kids will be ignored. Idea and action go hand in hand with Bernie. She blew a sharp trill on her coach's whistle. The room became silent. She nodded at her team and they marched to the stage chanting, South Side Sisters coming through. We finish any job we start to do. We played our best. We passed the test. We're the champs, so forget the rest. The girls stepped in front of the table. They stomped, twirled, and performed an elaborate choreography with their arms. The audience burst into applause, everyone relieved to abandon fights over plans for the lakefront. The woman on the platform told the girls what a credit they were to the South Side, to the values of hard work and determination, and presented each with a certificate and a red rose. Another sponsor, a local pizzeria, handed out coupons for free pizzas, and the girls marched off the stage yelling their chant again, more loudly than before. So VI and Bernie leave the meeting. VI has parked, for those of you who know this neighborhood, there's a parking lot right next to the Burnham Wildlife Corridor, just west of Lakeshore Drive, and VI has parked there. She's going to drive Bernie home to Evanston. And as I go under the 47th Street viaduct, we heard the kind of hollow tinkling made by a xylophone, discordant, disturbing. I moved close to a pillar and finally saw where the music was coming from. A figure shrouded in gray bent over a red plastic piano like the one Schroeder plays in Peanuts. Like Schroeder, the figure was getting an amazing amount of sound out of the toy. I tried to push Bernie along, but she was listening wide-eyed to an ominous rhythm the pianist was producing in the instrument's lowest octave. Do you hear that? She cried. It's savage. I shook my head, uncomprehending. How are you not knowing it? It is the greatest song of the last 10 years about this woman, this Indian chief woman, 
Her name was Ana Ka'ana, and the Spanish murdered her when she wouldn't be their whore. My whole high school sang it for First Nations Day, but it is so much more than that. Like for women, when we have a march to protest rape or the horrible incel bastards, we drum, we sing it. Who is playing this song in this place? Is there a protest? Should we be joining? The pianist suddenly brought the tempo down. The music shifted from an Afro pop beat to a heavy three, two meter. After a few measures, I made out what sounded like the lament from Purcell's Dido and Aeneas. I began to sing, remember me, but forget my fate. Bernie cut me off. No, 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 that's not how it goes. It's remember me and announce my fate. Sorry, I said meekly. I was singing Purcell's version. Who wrote the one you know? Lydia Zamir. First, she was an ordinary musician, but then she started writing songs about women like for hashtag me too. She was in love with this man and they traveled around to different rallies. And then they were shot and killed at one of those horrible mass murders. Some cretin with too many guns opened fire on them. And that's where we will leave all of these people at the beginning of turmoil about Lydia and about land. <laughs> Thank you for that wonderful introduction to characters that create this novel and stories. Um, I wonder if we could start our conversation with V.I., your legendary detective, who actually admits in this novel to feeling a bit creaky and mildewed, but her quick tongue and her fearless attitude and her temper, her famous temper, are all there, bless her. It's impossible for anyone to dismiss her once she gets her teeth into something. Would you tell us a bit about the genesis and development of this remarkable character? How did you birth her and, and how did she get her name? Oh my goodness, she was a long time, um, I was a long time in the labor room, I guess, with her. I'd been a reader of crime fiction since I was uh, in my teens and in my twenties when second wave feminism began making me think more closely about the kind of, of images of women in the books that I like to read. And I saw that women could either be vamps, they could be virgins, in which case they were incapable of tying their shoes in public without adult supervision. They were most often victims of crimes, but they weren't like the women that I knew. They weren't solving their own problems. They weren't having to multitask the way most people do, running families, running jobs, running all these different things all at the same time and coming up with creative solutions to their plans. So when I was 23, I thought, oh, I wanna create a woman detective who turns the tables on all these negative stereotypes. But even though I'd been writing since I was a small child, I didn't have confidence that I had a public voice, so to speak, that I could write outside the home. And it took eight years for me to trial and error, trying really pastiches of a Marlowe in, in drag, kind of Philip Marlowe from Raymond Chandler in drag, until I was working as a marketing manager at CNA Insurance in downtown Chicago and was part of the first wave of women to enter management in the professions and really in large numbers and saw the, you know, we had male mentors who were wonderful, but we had men who resented us being there. And it was a constant kind of tiptoeing, trying to see where you fit in and how you could get your voice heard in that kind of milieu. And really, I was at a meeting with my boss who um, was a major pill. The only good thing I can say about him was that he was as horrible to the men who worked for him as he was to the women. But uh, it was October, we were looking down at Grant Park with no leaves on the tree, everything looked about as dead as I felt in that meeting. And my lips were saying, oh, Fred, heck of an idea. And the balloon over my head was like, oh, you unspeakable turkey bird. And really at that moment, VI came to me that she would be a woman like me and my friends. She was doing a job that didn't exist for women then. You know, the first women allowed in the Chicago police force as regular officers happened a year after I published my first book in New York City and, Los and San Francisco as a year before I published my first book. So everything was changing, but women were fighting a lot of uphill battles then to get heard. And VI was born in that milieu. 
Okay. Tell, tell us about her name. Um, many people think it's attached to used car parts, I've heard. Right. But <laughs> Sadly, I did not know about Warshawski Auto Parts until, until several books into the series, I guess because I didn't own a car and I wasn't very, very focused on, on cars. But Chicago is, a, is one of the things that strikes you as an outsider coming to this city, and I was an outsider, in some ways I still am an outsider, even though I've been here 50 plus years, is how attached people are to their ethnic, racial, social identities. And one of my first paying jobs after I had been a volunteer working in the fringes of the civil rights movement was as a secretary in the political science department at the University of Chicago. And Polish American kids would come in wanting me to get them into closed classes or waive late fees. And I'd say no. And they'd say, you're a traitor to the Polish nation. And I was like, what? I'm just the secretary. I'm not grand enough to betray the entire nation of Poland. But it kind of introduced me to the way that people felt that these tribal identities took precedence over maybe larger social um, <laughs> responsibilities. And that wasn't part of my experience growing up. Yes, plenty of, of racism in Kansas for sure, but um, certainly white people didn't divide themselves into Irish, Italian, whatever. And so I wanted VI to reflect that Chicago, I don't know, identity, um, and I knew I couldn't write about an African-American or a, a Latinx character with any authenticity. I didn't think I could tackle Irish either. It's such a, a particular immigrant experience in this city. But I thought one of my grandfathers came from Poland, Warsaw, that's in Poland, Warszawski, that's gotta be a Polish name. Um, and then the initials just came to me, VI, which is why I always think of her by her initials and not by her name. It wasn't until I was months and months into writing the first book that I came up with her names. And, and now I wonder, would I have written a different character if I had named her Veronica instead of Victoria? I don't know, but poor thing, she's stuck with Victoria Iphigenia. And do we love her or what? <laughs> I can't be the only reader who um, has longed to be her best friend and who models myself on her in moments of despair. I think, what would VI do? I know. Uh, let me I'll know. Let me know. I always think VI would just be so annoyed if she knew that I was the person writing about her. She'd be like, oh, Paretsky, she's such a wimp. What is she doing? <laughs> Let's turn our attention to the stories in, in Deadland, um, which stretch, the stories stretch all the way from Chicago um, to Kansas to Chile. I'm very curious about the backstory that attaches to Hector, the young murdered lover of the missing singer-songwriter Lydia, because Hector's story takes us back to Chile in the 1970s when the democratically elected Allende government was overturned in a military coup. The dictator Pinochet grabbed power and thousands of people were murdered or disappeared under the regime. And there was an American, an American role in these events. H how did this strand of history end up in, in your novel? This is uh, something that has been very much on my mind for decades as, as both as it unfolded and, and in the aftermath because um, the Chicago economics faculty played a role in the destabilization of the, of the Allende regime and in the um, power shift. Uh, in the 50s, the CIA gave money to uh, Chicago economics faculty to set up a faculty in, in Chile as part of an effort to bolster American interests and conservative economic interests in the region. And to this day, if you Google Chicago boys, the first thing you'll see, or one of the first things you'll see listed are the Chilean economists with their ties to Chicago. And, and they're still very proud of that connection. Uh, and it, it has bothered me for a long time that we played this role in, in the destabilization of another country and that um, 
you know, 40,000 people were disappeared and presumed dead and the torture was horrific as it has been throughout the Americas with these kinds of regime changes. Um, and I can't explain why I thought the time had come to put that into a backstory. I can't remember. I mean, I made it, I had a reason that I'm not like Virginia Woolf who kept diaries about why she did made all the choices she did. I, I haven't kept that kind of record. So I can't say why this seemed like the, like the time to do it. But um, the other thing it's... that was very much on my mind was the number of mass shootings in this country and the number of people who have died as a result of mass shootings. I think that we are since 2010, we have had as many people die of mass shootings as we have lost to COVID yeah. uh, in the neighborhood of 300,000. And so the juxtaposition of, you know, a heavily armed citizenry able to, to take aim in agitation at anyone that, that annoys them and, um, and having that politically sanctioned seemed felt very urgent to me. Mm. I, I, I think I had a, a real, um, reading the backstory of, the, the, of Chile rem, reminded me of my very first early years in London in the 1970s when I watched those events unfold in London and so many Chileans um, who fled came to London. There was a huge um, movement that I was part of, and um, it brought it all back. Uh, and and I kind of want to turn now to how this novel seems um, saturated with a sense of loss. First, reaching back to those events when so many people died or disappeared at the hands of the junta. To the present day, um, the mass shooting at a public event. Uh, where Hector loses his life and um, Lydia's plunged into inconsolable grief. Almost every character is struggling with grief um, at the loss of a loved one. There are mothers with dead or missing children. There are friends mourning lost comrades, lovers, the loss of partners. Even the dog um, bear is clearly suffering at the separation from his very strange owner, Coop. Um, V.I. herself remarks on so much bloodshed everywhere on the planet, which you've just referred to. But there's also the loss of the land and the loss of faith and trust in public servants and democratic systems. I wondered if you could talk to us a bit about this powerful sense of loss and sadness and, and maybe link it to the motif of music, which is always prominent in V.I. novels, but particularly in this one, I think. Well, it's not a secret that I wrote this book while I was grappling with the death of my own husband, because I mentioned that in the um, afterward, and maybe I should have kept it to myself, but it was a struggle to stay focused and to write during those months. So, of course, loss was on my mind, but I think the early VI books, which I wrote in the 80s, when you know, we had such a sense of possibility then certainly there were there were warning signs, warning clouds on the horizon, but but horizons also were opening, doors were opening. The 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 world seemed as though you know we could we could make decisions for the common good that would stand us in good stead for years to come. So the first books, even though VI is struggling finding a role defining herself as a woman in a, in a masculine world, it, there's a certain insouciance that characterizes them. And I think was, was typical of, of crime fiction in that period to some extent. But the last 20, 30 years have, have been a very, given us a very different picture, both of, of the, uh, it's hard to say this in a in a concise way, but we live in a, in, a, in in an increasingly cramped society where we're aware of constant surveillance, where we're aware of of in in um, 
Adrian Rich's terms, lies, secrets, and silence that, that um, really are the hallmark of, of how our, many of our public institutions operate. It's increasingly difficult to bring um, white collar crime, which is what my books focus on, uh, it does enormous damage to people, but it's increasingly difficult to bring white collar criminals to justice because in the age of billionaires, they control so much, not just of systems of justice, but they own government offices. They become governors, they become presidents and, uh, and senators. You have to go down, I think, to 300 members of Congress. I'm not, I don't have the numbers right in my head before you find someone whose net worth is less than $10 million. Wow. And the net worth of the top members of Congress is in the half billion dollar range. So the divide between, between rich and poor, between people who feel entitled by virtue of money and power and position makes it increasingly difficult to bring people to justice. And VI perseveres and she makes it happen, but it gets harder and harder. And I think that's part of the sense of loss. I, yes, I, I'm, I, I'm not surprised that you explain that. And it also takes us to another um, area of loss. And that's the thread that is developed in the Murray Ryerson story. He's this once fearsome investigative reporter who now works for cable TV. Um, Press and news media are now dominated by the profit motive. Um, Chicago had a long proud history of independent print and media journalism, a very robust fourth estate. And th this thread about Murray's um, change from a, a, an independent journalist to a cable news person is haunts the backlist, but it's particularly salient, I think, in this era of um, fake news. Do you, could you talk to us about the death of investigative journalism and, and how that plays out in this novel? Well, mo many people in this audience will know about the, the John Burge uh, torture ring, the, the police who operated essentially with impunity for almost 20 years on the South Side, torturing hundreds of, of people, mostly African-American, mostly men, into confessing to crimes that they likely did not commit. Um, and that they had a, a pass through the state's attorney, through, um, through the um, Chicago City Council and so on, uh, and the reason that we know about this and the reason that the, that the torturing was finally ended was really the, uh, the extraordinary courage of one journalist whose name I should have at the tip of my tongue and don't, but he covered this for the reader for many years and forced us as a city to pay attention to what was happening. Well, in the, in, around the turn of the millennium as as media buyouts became greater and greater, every time a, a corporation cut their investigative reporting staff in half, their share price doubled on Wall Street. So there was tremendous profit incentive to stop investigative reporting. And thank you, somebody just put up, the reporter was John Conroy. Thank you so much yeah. for that. Um, he, um, and, and so, with the end with newsrooms and both print and, and television with, with their reporting staffs and the budgets cut to the bone, it just has become harder and harder to find a way to make, if you're not gonna get the state's attorney or the federal prosecutor to bring charges, then what VI always fell back on was Murray could shame people by outing them exactly in, in print. You can't, it's, I won't say you can't do that. It does still happen, but but it's a tiny voice in a very large wilderness. And in in this novel, he he hovers on the edge of death. So that's the closest he's come in all the, all the backlist. In the book that I'm working on now, on the book that I am I am struggling so much with this book, and it is just 
giving me a knockout punch every time I think I've got it going in a direction. But one of the things that goes on in the book that I'm actually writing is VI muses on all of the lovers who <laughs> she has driven away with maybe too much ferocity. Some of them actually were shot. And she says, it wasn't my fault. They didn't listen to what I had to say to them. But um, this is the first time that Murray's had to take one for the team, so to speak. Well, and readers, okay, readers will be reassured to know there is a, a, another VI adventure in, in the works. Uh, late, but you know, it's due in New York, January 15th. Well, that isn't going to happen. That's a, um, I that's wanted, a hard thing. Um, I want to just try try one or two more questions before we um, have a look in the chat box and turn our attention to the list that um, people have already submitted. Um, can I swivel to VI going on the road and ending up in Kansas where she feels small town life is too much for her and can't wait to get back to Chicago? And I also noticed that when she goes on the road, she mainly sustains herself out of vending machines. Is this something out of your own experience? Do you, <laughs> you know, people ask, one of the few good things about COVID is doing virtual book events instead of being on the road, because there you are, you do an event, you uh, get back to your hotel at nine or 10 o'clock, the restaurant's closed and you eat peanut butter uh, cracker things out of vending machines. So being on the road is, um, it's bad food at weird hours and not getting very much sleep. So, uh, so VI shares that experience. <laughs> because food does play a big role in the novels. It always has, especially through her mother, Gabriella and VI's love of Italian food. So to see her eating out of vending machines is heartbreaking, yeah, truly. And stomach wrenching. Yes. VI VI can continue to drink lots of lovely wines. She doesn't have the, the GI problems that I do that have inhibited my drinking. Uh, although I, you know, I wasn't paying attention to the fact that she was following me into abstinence or relative abstinence until I got a letter. There's an Armagnac Society in London, only in England would this happen. I got a letter from the president of the Armagnac Society saying, what happened to Warshawski? She used to drink all these lovely Armagnacs and now she hardly drinks at all. And I thought, oh no, poor thing. She's taken all these hits and now I'm making her give up alcohol too. And so a <laughs> lot of detectives in, in the kind of book I write, many of them, the majority of them even maybe are struggling with alcoholism. They're recovering alcoholics. So they're trying to give up alcohol. They fight each drink. And I'm... Um, I'm the opposite. My detective needs to drink more. I'm upping her alcohol intake so that she has a way of relaxing at the end of a very hard day. Yeah, she's still drinking whiskey. Someone wanted to know that. Yeah, black label, not red label. And she's, uh, for very special occasions, she's now discovered as I also have uh, Brunello wines from Tuscany. But, um, it's interesting, I grew up in rural Kansas. I went to a two room country school. You are naked in the prairies in a way that you never are in the city. Everyone is watching you and knows what you're doing. It's kind of like having a miniature NSA right there in your backyard uh, and talking about you behind your back. But the, the relationships and the secrets, everyone keeps them secret because that's how the society functions. You can't be you know, everybody knows, but nobody says. Um, but at one point, she's in this small town in Kansas, Ellsworth. I think the population is 3,000, maybe it's 5,000. Um, and many bad things have happened in Ellsworth. She's been shot up. Her Mustang is a wreck. She's getting it fixed in a, um, in a body shop there in Ellsworth. And they are anxious for her to be gone. And... Um, the, the uh, guy who has the, the dealership, he does a special deal with a cousin to quickly get parts that would normally take weeks to get uh, because, and he says, um, parts are on the house, I'm just charging you labor. Just thought it would be best for everyone if you got out of town quick, don't you know? He grins shyly, only half kidding and not sure whether I could take it. 
I'm on my way, I assured him. Ellsworth's way too rough for me. I need a tame city like Chicago. <laughs> I, I love that. I love seeing VI out of her comfort zone <laughs> and eager to get back to it. It's wonderful. Um, I'm going to ask you one more question about um, other women in your novels, and then we'll um, have a look at uh, questions from readers, from uh, people on the event. You often name forgotten real women by, for instance, mentioning a painting in, in VI's office um, and naming the painter, or in this novel, naming Kate Buckingham as the um, person who gifted the famous Lakeside Fountain. Um, is this a project to reclaim women in the public sphere? Is that a good way to describe it? it it's a hallmark. I wouldn't that say I... that it's a deliberate thing. I don't start the book thinking, oh, there's this list of women whose names have been ignored. But, but, it, but it is more, I think, it is not easy or fun to get older, old, although Hyde Park Village provides many ways for people to do that with a lot more confidence maybe than, than we could without Hyde Park Village. Um, but over the, the course of 50 years of writing, 45 years of writing, I feel that the, the arc of my work is on voice and claiming voice and claiming agency and that um, one of the welcome changes of the last decades and certainly of the last 10 years, the last very much last 12 months have been the way in which women have been able to step forward and, and, and claim much more agency and have their voices much more attended to than they were in the past. But it's, it's always good to, um, the, I'm always learning about people, people of color and women of, of all races who made contributions that I didn't know about. And so they're on my mind and I tend to have very little separation between what's on my mind and what I write. And so they, they go into the books. And then I live in a neighborhood, I live in a part of the city where there were um, groundbreaking African-Americans uh, who really battled odds to, to do extraordinary things. The first open heart surgery in the world was performed by an African-American doctor um, about a mile from my home. Ida Barnett Wells lived nearby, the famous journalist crusader. And, and um, I guess I always think, oh, these people are amazing and yeah, we should know about them. And I think I even mentioned the open heart surgery in Deadland in passing because that hospital sadly is a Provident is a travesty of its former self, but it is where that surgery was performed. Well, it's yes, these these voices are entering the public arena in a way that they haven't before, as you say. Um, what one of the participants today wishes he could be a fly on the wall at a conversation between you and Ilhan Omar. <laughs> We'd all like that. Um, Okay, I'm going to uh, collect a few questions now from chat and previously um, registered questions. One of which is what people are curious about what you're reading now and, and what's stacked up on your bedside table. You know, Toni Morrison once said, why do people assume that I only read in bed? But it is true that it is my <laughs> bedside table where, where they all stack up and it's very eclectic. I'm reading right now the, the uh, one book Chicago book, Exit West. Uh, and forgive me that I'm not remembering the author's name, but it, it, it's a Syrian writer in exile. And it is such a, it's a deceptively simply written book that is so profound and so deep. I'm reading it slowly. Another book reissue of William Maxwell's So Long See You Tomorrow. This one is kind of, the writing is beautiful, the prose, I mean, but the story is painful, so I keep leaving it. Um, I took part in, a, in an auction last week called Mystery Loves Georgia, where a whole bunch of mystery writers contributed auction items to raise money for Fair Fight, the uh, voter registration project in, in Georgia. And through that auction, I learned about a woman crime writer whose work I didn't know named Tammy Kaler, K-A-E-H, 
L-E-R, um, who was a race car driver in her, in her youth and now has a series set with a woman, Le Mans professional driver. And it's just, it's great fun because um, I myself have a 1995 Jaguar convertible that is not race track worthy, but I love driving around town in it and um, when it's functioning. And uh, just getting the inside uh, look at what it's actually like to be in one of those cars. It, it's, a, it's a very uh, adrenaline pumped book. Okay. Um, speaking of books, people, a couple of people are wondering if the pandemic might find its way into a future novel. I'm sure this is a problem many or an issue many, many writers are grappling with. You know, it's part of the reason that the book that I'm writing is so far behind schedule, because my books, they really are set in the present. They have backstories that take us into the past, but I'm not interested in writing, at least right now, in writing a period piece like V.I.'s Past Life or prequel or anything like that. And so it was very hard for me to get traction in the early days of the pandemic. I was both trying to write too globally and was living in, there were so many things we didn't know. And as it unfolded, everything that I was writing became more and more problematic. So the pandemic is sort of reflected in the book in the way that uh, VI is still running around town, but everyone who talks to her has to wear a mask. And, um, and part of the friction, she ends up, uh, we're reprising the, the Burge police in uh, Homan Square on the west side of Chicago. Uh, there's some ominous signs coming out of Homan Square and um, the very macho police lieutenant who VI is rubbing up against, you know, he, part of his macro aggression is to come close to you and not be wearing a mask uh, as a protection against the virus. So in that way, the, the pandemic is coming in and also in the way that some of the ways in which it's affecting people economically. Um, but other than that, it's more the backdrop than it is the central theme of, of the book. I think it's also hard to make sense of events that are right up in your face and that mm. I was trying to do that way too soon with what I mm. was writing in April and May. I, I can imagine that the um, distance will will um, help uh, in grappling with things like that. I was one, I was thinking about how difficult post pandemic it would be now to write some of the scenes that you have in this novel which show happy families together in the in the playground and bunching right. up next to each other and having picnics and all that stuff along the the lakefront it's it's no longer going to be very easy to write that um or read yeah, it. yeah you know the, i think it's a challenge that everyone is facing both in their personal lives and also you watch some of the like those of us who have series shows that we like to watch that some of them have new episodes that are coming on and you don't see people masked or or being or paying attention to the pandemic and part of it is oh yeah these are your old buddies that you're glad to see again but part of it is this is just too surreal mm, exactly and speaking of series um one participant wonders if there are any um, movies or tv series planned using the character and the setting well, um, Disney made a movie that um, I think, my opinion, deservedly disappeared almost without a trace back in 1991. It was just called V.I. Warshawski, and it was made, it was sort of a, a mashup of, um, of three, of story, bits of stories from the first three books, which were what had been published when they signed the contract. However, uh, the world of conglomerate has come around in my favor in that um, now that Disney has acquired all these Fo Fox entertainment channels and they're looking for more content, they finally, after 30 years of refusing to budge on doing anything with the character and they own the rights to the character in perpetuity, um, 
they suddenly are interested in making something for their FX channel. And so I don't know that anything will be made, but I know that production talks are underway as we speak. Okay. Watch this space. All right. Are you prepared to mention any favorite women fictional detectives of yours? Well, um, you know, I just go back to near the beginning with um, Amelia Butterworth and the Anna Catherine Green novels of the 1870s, 80s. Amelia was uh, a decade ahead of, of Sherlock Holmes and Conan Doyle was very jealous of Anna Catherine Green's financial commercial success. And he actually sought her out when he came to the States, winning tips from her on, on what made her, her books sell in the millions of copies. Um, and I, it, you know, I, I won't say they are fabulous books, but it, it's a great detective and very fun to, to watch the inside workings of, of the criminal justice system, which the author knew firsthand because her father had been a criminal lawyer and, and the cases were all handled in their living room. He didn't have an office downtown. Uh, Kate Fansler, Amanda Cross, <coughs> Those books feel very dated in a way, very stiff, but seeing Amanda Cross was one of the impetuses for, for getting me thinking that I could create the character that I ultimately did create. I don't know about the women characters, but there are a lot of women writers that I like very much that I really admire. Denise, um, I'm never sure if it's Mina or Mina. And I even asked her when I was in Scotland whether in February, and I can't remember what she said. Great writer, uh, wonderful, wonderful characters. Um, I loved Anna Lee in the Liza Cody books and um, uh, Liza will not write any more about Anna Lee, and I, which kind of makes me pout when I talk to her. Um, there are great women characters here on this side of the Atlantic. Nevada Bars and a Pigeon series is a wonderful series. Really, when I start naming other writers, I feel like oh, I'm leaving out people that I really admire and they'll come to me later. So the fact that I'm mentioning some and not others shouldn't be taken to mean that I don't also like and respect a lot of their work. It's just... Okay, let's let's turn to some process questions. Um, several people are curious about the research process. Um, so I wondered if you could take this novel as an example and tell us about a storyline or two that needed research and what sources you went to. And I imagine that Hyde Park is chock full of places that offer really good source material. Well, for Hyde Park history, we, we do have a local historical society. Um, I feel kind of like a brat, but my neighborhood library is the University of Chicago Library. And that's another thing that I really missed uh, in this pandemic is not being able to go in there and go in the stacks and browse. I actually one day took a, a selfie in front of Regenstein and posted it online because it was like, oh, I want to be in this building and I can't go in. I have to camp out outside. Um, I do consult experts and I get a lot of mail telling me all the mistakes I make with weapons. Um, and I'm always talking to people who know about weapons and I always think I understand what they're saying. And yet um, I get letters ranging from Oh, one person wrote and said, I know you're a communist trying to take guns away from every American because you make so many mistakes with guns that if someone followed what you did with them, they would kill themselves. To people who are more, you know, patient and forgiving, but still it's like, if you ever want to write about the difference between a cartridge and a bullet again, will you please talk to me? Uh, because you got it wrong. And it's like, oh, one of my brothers hunts and I talked to him and obviously I wasn't listening carefully because I got it wrong once again. Okay. Um. <laughs> Somebody else wants to know a bit about your routine. Do, do you have a set routine for a daily goal of page or word numbers? And do you have a most productive time of day or night or? Yeah, I used to do my best work at night and I think I still 
am a night person. It's just that I, I sleep so badly that um, at night I'm now falling asleep. And, and I, I was like, ah, oh, this is when I would really be like in my Batmobile being most productive as a, as a more of a night owl than a day person. So I try, I do try to have a daily routine, but I'm not real good at it. I'm, I'm always tense talking about my process because my process just feels so um, unskillful, inadequate. And, um, you know, the, November is write a novel in a month month. I can't remember what it's called, but people try to write 50,000 words in the month of November. And I took part in a webinar last month that Sisters in Crime was running on coaching people on how to write. And I thought, well, I have never written 50,000 words in a month, even when I was young and my shoulders were fit and I could sit at a typewriter for hours. Um, I could not possibly write that much. And some of it is, uh, I, I think that in, in my mind, people, there are people who are really like chess players. They can see so many moves ahead that they can either outline or it's in their head how the book will work out. And if you're that kind of person able to think in that way, then it might be possible to set yourself a daily goal of X many pages. But I only know by trial and error, I can't think ahead that way until characters are in motion. I can't see whether the story idea that I was working on really works for them. And so, you know, I'd like just in the hopes of getting this book done in time to meet the production schedule, I certainly won't get it um, done by January. But my goal is like 1500 words a day. And yesterday I wrote 500 words and I thought, oh, this is just sucks, but to use the professional language. But but I sort of don't see what's happening next in the story and what to do with these characters. And so for those of you who live near me, if you smell burning rubber, that's my brain trying to figure out what happens next in the book. Well, I think you've answered the question that was um, wanted to know what happens after you get an idea. Do you map it out or do you begin writing and let it take shape? I think you do the latter. And right. And when, I mean, I know happens. I start with the idea of a crime and I know right. what the crime is, but even like in this book, the one that I'm wrestling with right now, um, I have four different entities that are kind of involved in perpetrating the crime and getting, figuring out how to weave them together. That's, uh, it's, you know, it'd be a little bit harder than I thought it would be. Okay. And somebody, while we're on process, one, one or two, one more, I think. Um, somebody wants to know about the show versus tell problem. And I, I'm guessing it might be somebody who's, who's, who's um, writing himself. He's hoping that showing action rather than telling becomes a habit as you write more. What, would you like to comment on that? Well, as to whether it becomes a habit, I think there are things that you just constantly have to remind yourself of. One of the things that I, that I, you know, I'm always learning how to write a better sentence. And, um, you know, I, I want good sentences that, that say what I'm trying to say. I think there are some writers, some books, like to me, uh, Marilyn Robinson's book, Gilead, um, where you just feel like your head was right up against her head, her thought turned into words that turned into the thought in your brain. It's so, the writing is so transparent. And that's my idea, my ideal for myself is transparent prose. I don't meet it very often. I tend to be a little bit verbose as I'm being right now. Ooh, Sarah, wrap it up, tighten Let's it up. Go. Um, well, I'll, can I? Did, yeah, go ahead. Are you go finished? Ahead. Yeah. Well, I wondered if we should um, pick up a question that Susan, who gave us the wonderful intro, um, wanted to raise. And that is, um, she, she is aware that you first came to Chicago in the civil rights era of the late 1960s. And she's wondering how you would um, relate those earlier protests. And uh, I know you came particularly around the time of the fair housing um, work that Martin Luther King was doing. Um, 
and what have we achieved and learned and how do they how do those um protests compare to the ones that were engaged in today even with pandemic and i you've touched on this a bit but do you want to say more about what we've well, achieved well you know to me my view on this is uh in in the 60s um protest of injustice and the racial injustice that runs like a very deep seam through the entire spectrum of U.S., not spectrum, but depth of U.S. history is, um, was in the 60s was really an African-American protest with a few white voices joining in. The, the joy that I felt this summer, despite the the horrors that unfolded um, was that the majority of people and the majority of young people were on of of all races were on board with with the goal of these protests. Whether that translates into meaningful policy change remains to be seen, of course. But I felt that we had we had come a great distance in fifty years that 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 gave me hope in ways that I didn't feel hope. The negative though, I think is, is that the, the reaction is so much more virulent and violent. There are so many guns and so much heavy firepower spread across the country now that it's, it's really hard to have, I don't know, civil discourse on civil issues. Maybe it never was possible. Maybe it was always violent. I did a PhD in history at the University of Chicago and with John Hope Franklin um, writing you know, some of the work that he did on reconstruction after, after the Civil War shows you that that violence was, you know, goes back, a, goes back to the beginning of issues about race in this country. But I think the positive is we've, we've traveled a great distance and, um, and that's hopeful. Yes, it is hopeful. And, and so is the fact that there's a younger generation stepping up and um, sure that they can make a difference if they stay with the struggle. And that's what we felt in the sixties. So yep. I, I take hope from my godchildren and um, the younger generation and the readers. A couple of people have said that they're on, on the chat line have talked about young, knowing younger readers, 14, 15 year olds who are reading your books and um, taking inspiration from them. So that's, that's good. That's very good. I'm aware that we're probably running out of time and I'm not sure um, if I'm supposed to wrap things up or hand back to somebody. I'm just gonna check chat and make sure we haven't missed any other crucial questions. Um, okay, how's your dog doing? <laughs> <laughs> I'll find out next Tuesday. She has a broken foot and she's, uh, it's very slow to heal. So, um, not, uh, don't call her. She's, uh, there's her, well, you can't see her foot. I was trying to display her casted foot. She's been in a cast for nine weeks. Uh, so we're hoping next week the x-rays will show that the bone is healing and she can get uncasted. Well, I'm going to say a big thank you. I'm going to remind people about the um, bookstores, seminary and further afield women and children first that will supply you with signed and personal and or personalized copies from Sarah. Um, th thank you. I, I know that Hyde Park wants to uh, come back on board and wrap this up properly, but so I'm just going to say thank you to the audience um, thank you to Sarah. Um, I've really enjoyed this and um, let's do it again. Next book. Yeah. Oh, we would. So, Margaret, thank you so much. We would so love to be able to do this again. This is wonderful. And 
we are grateful to both of you for taking some time out of your day to, to talk with us. As you see, we've had a huge audience and we have more people who will be accessing the recording that we've made. And I, just, I can't thank you enough for, for being so open and transparent and discussing both your work and your ideas and, um, and, and your hope. At, at a time that we really do need hope. So thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Susan. Thank you to everyone who came and, and shared part of your day with us. It was, uh, it was also great to do this at a time when readers outside this time zone could be part of it. So um, Thanks thank a lot you, to everyone. Thank you to the neighborhood, good old neighborhood centers like libraries. We need them. <laughs> and seminary co-op bookstore. Yes. Thank, yeah, thank you, everyone. Uh, enjoy the rest of the afternoon. And um, this was just wonderful. Thank you so much.